Nunavut is Canada's most sparsely populated province. It's also the country's largest and most northern territory. Created in 1999 with the Nunavut Act, it is also the most recent major change in the country's map since Newfoundland's admission in 1949. While it may appear recent, this territory, this piece of land, has long been inhabited by the Inuit and Dorset cultures for a long, long time. And now, sadly, many of these original villages no longer exist. So today, let's look at three different ghost towns in Nunavut and explain their history and why they may no longer be inhabited. Now, there are many definitions of ghost towns, but the villages we're looking at today have no inhabitants. So without further ado, make sure you subscribe and let's dive into Nunavut's ghost towns. Our first stop is Dundas Harbor, an abandoned settlement in Nunavut's Kikiktaluk region. You see, this settlement was originally established to combat the illegal whaling industry in Nunavut, and it was leased by the mighty Hudson's Bay Company in 1933. The following year, 50 Inuit arrived at the settlement, but they did not stay for long as they returned to the mainland 13 years later. They attempted to re-establish it as a patrol station in the late 1940s, but the ice proved too difficult and it was abandoned once more. This RCMP outpost did not last long, but a few buildings remain and it's also home to one of Canada's most northern cemeteries. While this is an abandoned settlement, you can still visit it if you have a small little 17,000 US dollars to spare. And now the RCMP also visits the settlement on an annual basis to ensure the cemetery is still in good condition. This is an excellent example of early Canadian efforts to achieve true sovereignty in the high Arctic. But moving forwards, we have another trading post that was established by the Hudson's Bay Company, and this will be a recurring theme throughout the video. You see, at the time, the Hudson's Bay Company was the largest and strongest commercial entity in Canada, and is still the oldest company in Canada today. But it's important to note that back in those days, it was primarily used as a fur trading company. The Hudson's Bay Company established Fort Ross in 1937. Its establishment was intended to capitalize on the island's fur opportunities and to facilitate company trade passing through the Bellet Strait. Lawrence Learmonth, the company's first manager and longtime trader, chose this exact location. The post was also named after John Ross and James Clark Ross two related Arctic explorers. Its four structures, which included the post manager's house, a powerhouse, a warehouse, and a store, were constructed over the course of five days in September 1937. Following the arrival of the icebreaker SS Nascopi on September 2nd, which brought construction and food supplies. The Nascopi's first resident included Lorenz and other post staffs, including two clerks, as well as three Inuit families from Cape Dorset, who built their homes near the four post build. However, this arrangement did not last long following the annual resupply of the post in 1941, the Nascopi's next two resupplies in 1942 and 1943 fell to reach Fort Ross due to ice conditions. After the Nascopi was forced to return in September 1943, plans were made to evacuate the post staff because food supplies were beginning to run low, despite rationing and supplementing supplies through hunting. At the time, reaching the settlement was nearly impossible, and because all Canadian planes capable of performing the evacuation were unavailable due to the country's involvement in World War II, the Canadian government required assistance from the United States. A USAAF Douglas C-47 Skytrain was outfitted for the trip in November. And on the 4th of November, supplies were airdropped and the USAF Captain J.F. Stanwell Fletcher parachuted down to the post to prepare a landing site for the plane. And this marked the first parachute jump north of the Arctic Circle. So as you can see, this settlement and economic effort quickly devolved into a rescue mission, with food running out and ice conditions worsening. On November 7th, after preparing a landing strip on a small lake about 10 miles away from the post, the plane landed dropped off the remaining supplies for the Inuit population, and quickly took off again, successfully evacuating the post's three employees. The Inuit living there were given ammunition, flour, and staples to last them through the winter, but this was the only assistance they received. Even after my research, I still don't know what happened to the Inuit population living there, but they did know the territory much better and were much, much, much better hunters. Our final stop is Kilinik on Kilinik Island, which is a former Inuit settlement 
weather station, training post, missionary post, fishing station, and Royal Canadian Mountain Police Post. It was previously part of Labrador, and then the Northwest Territories, and is now part of Nunavut. Unlike our two other settlements, this one actually has a long history. You see, the Kalinic locality first appears in 1569, and it was visited in 1587 by John Davis, one of Queen Elizabeth's first chief navigator. He led several expeditions to discover the Northwest Passage and serve as pilot and captain on both Dutch and British ships. In August 1592, he even discovered the Falkland Islands, but returning to Kalinic, it was far from abandoned throughout the 1800s, with a weather station installed, training posts, and numerous visits from missionaries and researchers studying Inuit culture. However, this expansion would not last long. Although the Kalinic Inuit were recognized as a signatory to the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement in November 1975, this did not prevent a gradual deterioration in government services and programs. This decline created an insecure environment, resulting in a slow outmigration of families seeking settlements with guaranteed access to essential services particularly medical and air transportation. 50 Inuit left Kilinik between November 1975 and February 1978 in search of a more secure environment. On February 8, 1978, the 47 people who remained were informed by a radio that the Northwest Territories government was sending planes to remove them from the community and that the settlement would be closed. This Inuit settlement is one of the largest that is now abandoned, with a peak estimate population of 200 residents. And now you see throughout this video, there was a pattern where the federal government and trading posts would create these settlements, most likely without knowledge of the actual weather conditions there, which caused the abandonment of our first two settlements settlements in this video. And now if you like this brief overview, please like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next one.